we're going to talk about some, some things that are established. We're, we're working through the series. What's my role? What's your role? Okay? Not, not like tuck and roll, but that the, the position that you fill, the place that you are supposed to be. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today of, of some background because there's a, a very important thing that I need for you guys to understand. Um, so if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Exodus 19. I'm just going to point out a couple things as we go through here. Um, and bear with me because it might seem like I'm not going to make a point, but I will. It might not be the point that I think I'm making, but it will be a point. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Exodus, oh. 19, uh, I'm going to jump down here, the, the, the core part I would really want to touch on is uh, verses 5 and 6, but I'm going to read from verse 1 so you understand where we're going here. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai. They encamped in the wilderness. There, Israel encamped before the mountain. You know, he repeats encamp several times, so we need to keep that in our brain. Why is that there? Um, while Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you <coughs> shall be my treasured possession. Among all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. Okay, now, Keeping in mind the, the, the setting for this, um, God had brought the plagues on Egypt. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, he sent the final plague, which was what? Death of the firstborn. You have to get that in your head because this is going to play a key role in what's coming up. So he goes out. They go out. God speaks to Moses. Moses relays to the people. Now, now, look at the cause and effect here. Um, first, he gives the background. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, and I've delivered you out of that. Now, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. Okay, see, so here's the cause. This is, this is how we get to what's coming up. Right? You have to obey his voice. You have to keep the covenant. Okay? Now, keep in mind that this is prior to uh, all of the laws that we have in the Torah. Okay? Um, obeying God's word is of vital importance to us. Okay? The word that is written is sufficient as it is. Nothing is lacking in this that we need. Now, it's not all-inclusive, because there's not enough paper in the world to go over the attributes of God, okay? But it is the framework how we understand that God interacts with us and, and what our position relative to his is. And if you have not gotten to that point in your life where you fully understand the transcendence of God, the absolute holiness and purity of God, you won't fully appreciate what the redemption is. If you come to him saying, yeah, you know, I did some bad things, but for the most part, I'm a good person. Uh, what does Romans say about all have sinned? What else does it say? As it is written, there is no one. Not one. Okay. So if, if you have this, this deluded idea that, uh, you know, you're going to impress God because you're not so evil uh, and you're, you know, more in the camp of kind of good, um, you've got to understand the nature of sin. John writes in his first epistle that uh, if we claim to be without sin, 
we are a liar, and the truth is not in us. Okay. Um, now, as Christians, do we sin? <coughs> yeah, yeah, we still do. That's the marvelous thing about grace. Now, are we sinners? No. Our life is no longer defined by our sins. Our lives are defined by his grace and his redemption. Okay? So we are people that will sin less and less, less and less. But we will sin, but that does not define who we are. Okay? We are defined by the blood of Christ. We are now co-heirs with him. And to us has been given the right to be called the children of God. Okay? So... Verse 5, we hear his voice, we keep the covenant. Uh, actually, I'm going to say them because ours is a little bit different. We'll touch on that in a minute. Um, here's the reward. This is what God desires for them to have. Okay, You shall be my treasured possession among all the people, for all the earth is mine. But I treasure you. Now, think about that for a moment. Okay. Every single one of them is God's creation. Everybody that's ever been born is one of God's creation. And as the creator, he has the right to do whatsoever he will. Okay. As a matter of fact, you know, they talk about the pot questioning the potter. You know, I don't do pottery, but I do have breakfast bowls. And not a one of them has ever complained to me. Okay. I've complained to them several times, mostly when I spill them. But, but this is how serious this is. God sees something in us that he put there that he wants to bring out. He wants to define us with. Okay. You know, all of that went haywire in the garden. Couldn't even keep one rule. Okay. Still went wrong in Exodus. Couldn't keep ten of them. We have all of the laws that were given. The whole point of this, the whole point of all of this law is to make us understand how far removed we are from God. That in and of ourselves, we have not the ability to, to bridge that gap. Not, not a step. Okay? And so when we understand the, the sin in our lives and how abhorrent and repulsive that is to God, then we can appreciate what he did to bridge the gap. That we can stand before him in a righteousness not our own. Because his son has paid the price. Now, <clears throat> I personally, I do not subscribe to the theory that, uh, you know, you step out in the street, a car hits you, and you say, oh, crap, <coughs> or worse, that, you know, you've sinned, you're dying in your sins, and to hell you go. I believe absolutely that once a person has made a profession of faith, <clears throat> they're covered. Okay. But the problem with that is, is that a lot of people speak the words. A lot of people say things, and a lot of people have emotional moments while they're saying things. But of the four different types of seed that were scattered, how many bore fruit? Just one. Okay, just one. Now, all of the others at some point looked like that which was going to bear fruit, okay? But only one bore fruit. So, whom God has given Jesus in his hand, he will never let go. We belong to him, okay? Um, moving down a little bit more. Um, you are my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you will speak to the people of Israel. Now, think about this for a moment. The entire nation is going to be comprised of priests. Now, if you think about that, what's the priest's responsibility? As we go through scripture, what is it that the priests were responsible for? between God and man. Exactly. Yeah. They were the mediator that, that allowed communication between God and man and, and the redemption, the, the sacrifice between God and man. Now, if you think about this, if all of them are priests, 
Who are they priests to? The world. Everybody else. Everybody else. That's exactly right. Why did God choose them? It wasn't because they were the most populous. It wasn't because they were the smartest. It wasn't because they were, you know, whatever the world pursues. He chose them that through them he could demonstrate his work and his power, his authority, his love to the world. Okay? And he put them in a place that bridged three continents. So to go from one to the others, you had to come through their land. And he put them there that they might be a, a bypass, a, 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 an example, a testimony of the righteousness of God. All right? This is why I think it was so important. Well, there's, there's a couple other reasons, but I think this is why it was so important that when God spoke to Israel before they came into the land, he told them, all of them have to go. You can't let one reside because you'll be tempted to follow their gods. You read into Exodus and, and Joshua, and you find out that uh, quite a number of the, the possessions they never really got fulfilled because they didn't drive everybody out. And it's only a generation later that we see that now Israel is also worshiping Baal and, and Asherah and, and all the other gods. God wanted them gone so that his people would be a testimony to the goodness of God, not people just like everybody else around them. Okay? This is why I think we are marked different than those who live in the world. All right? So now, uh, if you have your scripture, we're going to jump over to Leviticus 10. <clears throat> so we know that originally God called Israel to be a nation of priests. As being a nation of priests, they were to be priests, intermediaries between the world and God. Now, we see kind of a, a unique building going on here. I think it's an amazing thing that God chose Aaron to be the priest, the high priest. I mean, you look at some of the things that Aaron did. I don't know, I just threw in the gold and out came these calves. Hey, who do you think you are, Moses? God speaks to us and through us. Shame on you. Now, personally, I think that was uh, not so much Aaron as Miriam. And the reason I think that, uh, you kind of get the impression that, that Aaron sometimes was just uh, he's too easily pushed. He didn't remain steadfast. I think it was Miriam that, that Aaron was afraid to gainsay against her because... She got the leprosy, not him, okay? Um, but you think about these mistakes that he made, and God still chose him to be high priest. Okay? He chose him to be the one man at that time when God's presence settled above the mercy seat. Only Aaron got to go in there. Moses didn't get to go in there. Joshua didn't get to go in there. Only Moses got to go into the Holy of Holies. Okay? To me, that speaks uh, a tremendous amount. It gives me a tremendous amount of hope because if God can use Aaron to be a high priest and God can use David and his immorality to bring through the line of Christ with the woman that he had relations with outside of marriage, uh, God used that to bring about the parentage of the Messiah. Okay? God, you've got to understand how awesome God's grace is. How incredibly overwhelming, how wide, how deep uh, your sin doesn't stand a chance before his grace. Okay? So, going on here, we see that God has chosen out Aaron and his four sons. They are going to be the priests. And uh, then we, we run into a little bit of a problem. <clears throat> Verse 1, now Adab and Abihu, these are the two oldest sons of Aaron, uh, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer <coughs> and put fire in it.
and laid incense on it and offered an authorized, or some, some uh, translations say uh, strange, and offered unauthorized or strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Think about that for a moment. The, the firstborn of his sons and the secondborn of his sons have been consumed in a moment. In a moment. They're gone. Half of his male children is gone. Now, in America, we don't really understand, we don't really follow through with, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, the significance of birth order. Some people like to dilly-dally with it, and you know, the firstborn is, is usually the one that's to take charge, and then the second one's the troublemaker, and then the third one is awesome, and then, you know, from there, you know. Um, but we do have a, a lot of studies that indicate that there's a significance to birth order, okay? Um, now, Adab and Abihu have offered fire that was not sanctified. It was not as God had required of them, and they're gone. I love this line. And Aaron held his peace. He held his peace. It doesn't say how he felt. But I, I can't imagine the grief, the hurt that must have been going on in him. So, God has established Aaron as a high priest, his sons to be priests underneath him. Two of the four have been, been uh, removed because they weren't serious about what God said. Um, flip over to Numbers 25, verse 7. While Israel lived, I'm, I'm verse 1, uh, while Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Well, that'll wake you up, won't it? <laughs> Sometimes I think we are too soft um, in our manners to explain things the way they are. Um, you look at the writings of Paul, he was incredibly blunt sometimes shockingly so, okay? You look at some of the prophets, the things that they wrote that God had given them, the things that they said, uh, shocking. They offend our sensibilities. But it is by the inspiration of God that they wrote those things, okay? So um, they, um, these, verse two, these invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation, the congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, now this is Aaron's grandson, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the high priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them. The man of Israel and the woman through her, her belly. Thus the plague of the people of Israel was stopped. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how many of you guys had siblings that uh, you would share a room with? Okay, all right. Now, if you guys were anything like me and my siblings, uh, a not infrequent occurrence would happen, uh, oh, I don't know, probably two or three times a year. You'd be laying in bed and you'd start talking about goofy stuff and, and somebody would get up and start acting and dancing and, and they would be saying silly things and, you know, dad would step into the doorway. Mm -hmm. And the one that's doing this is totally oblivious. Everybody else is trying so hard not to cry because they're laughing so hard. And dad just stands there and watches. And after a moment or two, <laughs> my dad had an incredible presence it like radiated this, this fear that uh, one day he would just off you, <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes when I was getting a beating it, <laughs> I thought maybe okay this is it <laughs> alright so Nadab and Abihu have strange fire now we have this thing they're in the wilderness. It's not even been a generation. And they start hooking up with the people around them. Sorry. Everybody turn around and look at Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, she's red. All right, so they start pouring after these other gods. Uh, we see the parallel throughout scripture that uh, chasing after other gods, idolatry is also called adultery. Okay? And here we have a, a perfect example of this. Everybody's weeping and grieving, and this dude comes in with a woman. Hey, see you in a little bit. And they head to the chambers, and Phineas... <laughs> Phineas <laughs> Phineas took his ball <laughs> Phineas grabs a spear and he goes in and, and quite honestly if you read the way this is written he and she were going after it and he took the spear and pinned them to the ground. Okay. This is one of those moments where God was at the door watching them and they were completely oblivious. You know, sometimes dad made its presence known when you gotta pop upside the rear. Okay. In this case, I you gotta wonder what this guy is thinking. He goes by all these people that are weeping and mourning and people that are getting killed. And he's only got one thing on his mind. Just just one thing. And it cost him his life. Okay? So we see that the priesthood, because this is uh, a grandson of Aaron, they have certain responsibilities that they do. And in this case, it is to remove the stain from the people. Okay? Um, later we see that uh, in, in the laws they are responsible for uh, checking to see if somebody is, is leprous and thus has to be removed from the camp. They have to check a house where uh, mold or, or some other thing came in and they would have to check it, go through the procedure. Uh, next thing, Numbers chapter 3. Now. I know we're kind of going in circles here. I've got one more section to do, and uh, we'll wrap it up. It's even harder to hold the news. I'm not going to give all of this to you, um, but I want to hit a very significant point. Um, okay. 
Do you remember <coughs> what the final plague was in Egypt? Death. Death of the firstborn. Now God took that and he made that his own. Because he took the life of the firstborn of everyone in Egypt that did not have the blood over their door, God chose for himself the firstborn in all of Israel. <laughs> now, God has declared it that the firstborn is his. And so he took from Israel the firstborn of the people, their animals, their uh, crops, that was his. But God kind of changed things a little bit. As God called out Aaron for the priesthood and Aaron's family for the priests, he also called out the Levites. And he exchanged the firstborn of every family for the Levites. And it's, it's actually very interesting because there was a certain amount of money that you were required to give, a certain amount of offering that you were required to give to redeem the firstborn back to you. Okay? And they actually did the math and they found out, well, the tribe of Levi is still short the number of the firstborn. And so they had to pay the difference between how many Levites there were and how many firstborn there were. And, and the difference they, they had to pay for because they were paying the redemption price. Okay? So God has called the Levites out, and he says, you're going to help Aaron, and you're going to take care of the things, and you're going to be the worshipers, you're going to be the ones that clean stuff. You're getting all of this so that the priests can do what their job is to do. Okay, Keep that in mind. You might want to write that down because we're going to get to that in the New Testament as well. Okay, So go through. I encourage you to read this, um, this passage in, in chapter 3. No. Study it. Don't just let your eyes flip back and forth over the page. Study it. I would encourage you that you have a Bible that you can write in. Okay? Um, preferably one with big margins so that you can put to know. I'm not telling you I want you to get a study Bible because then you get lazy. You just read all the stuff below the line. Okay? What's important is the stuff above the line. Everything below the line is somebody's opinion about what it means. Okay? So, um, now we see God has established uh, the priesthood. He's established the Levites. These are the people that will work. Um, you know, you have all the people, then you have the Levites, then you have the priests, then you have the high priest, and then it's just God. Okay? Now, interestingly enough about this, um, for as anti-Semitic as the Catholic Church has been throughout its history, <clears throat> they follow very closely to all that was commanded in the establishment of the priesthood. The high priest, the pope, the other, uh, I don't even know the, prior, the, the organization in the Catholic Church, um, but underneath the pope you have, what is it, cardinals? Cardinals, cardinals that's the priesthood. And then underneath them, bishops, bishops, bishops and you have the, the uh, clergy, which is very similar to what we see being laid out in the Old Testament. Now, those of you that have come out of the Catholic Church, you read through these things and it's going to be very obvious to you where the Catholic Church got these. Are they bad? No, they're not bad. There's not a bad scripture in you. Okay? There are some uncomfortable ones. There are some ones that will make you squirm. But there's not a bad one in you. Now, Let's wrap this up. Who's the clergy? Who's the clergy here today in, in the church? Who's the clergy? Really? You. <laughs> nope. Actually, it's all of us. Uh, flip open to 1 Peter chapter 2. Okay. 1 <clears throat> Peter chapter 2.
Okay, I'm, I'm actually going to back up to uh, chapter 1, verse 20. He, this is Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world that was made uh, manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, <clears throat> so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Wow. Boy, does the church need to hear that. Love one another earnestly. It's an action. Uh, what was the, the song DC Talk had? Um, love, love is a bird. bird. Yeah, love is a bird. Um, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now, pure heart has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. You can take confidence in that passage right there. Okay. One of the first things that the enemy tries to do is to uh, talk about the validity or the accuracy of the word. Uh, things got corrupted depending on what Bible you need. God's big enough to handle it, okay? He's big enough to handle it. There are some versions that I will warn you against because uh, it's not a matter of interpretation. It's a matter of insinuation. They rewrite scriptures to prove their theology rather than letting the scriptures say what it says. Um, so going back down, uh, the word of the Lord remains forever, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. So now, chapter 2, verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Isn't that so cool? Isn't that awesome? The world looks at us like we're idiots, like we're rubble, we're trash. And yet in God's eyes, we are chosen and precious. You yourselves, uh, let me back up again, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become a cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they do because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now, this is where we connect all of these parts together. <clears throat> but you, this is all of you, this is me, okay? This is for all believers. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Amen. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. It's an incredible thing. 
that God would, what is man that you are mindful of him? Mm. And he chose. And he looks at you as precious. He sees value in you that nobody else sees. And oftentimes even yourself. He says you're precious. I, I can feel that a little bit when I'm holding Phineas. Just as, as a grandpa. I hold him like he's precious. When they get to be about three and heavy, I, they're precious on the floor. Okay. But God has chosen you. We are his race. We are his royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for his own possession. He has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has chosen us to be his people. Now that does not negate the promises that he made to Israel. He will still fulfill all of his word for Israel. Okay? Amen. But right now it's the time of the Gentiles. And then when the time of the Gentiles ends, it will go back to the time of the Jews. Okay? So, in this, there is no clergy and there is no laity. We're all children. Now, each of us is called to different roles. And those, those roles vary dramatically. Okay? Um, but God has gifted you with the calling that he has put on your life. When you start stepping into what God has called you to do, he's going to meet you right there with everything you need. Right? Because okay, if you don't believe that, you're not going to take that step. God always requires a step of faith before he gives you the promise. God will tell you, hey, look, this is where I want you to be. Get moving. Okay? And if we stand there waiting, that's not faith. I read something a while back, and I may have shared it before, uh, but two farmers, both believers, were in the middle of a drought, and they prayed the exact same prayer. Father, we need rain. We need rain, we need moisture, that our crops would grow. And then, one went out, and he plowed his field, and he planted his seed. Now, who was praying in faith? Yeah, the one that planted. All too often, God calls us to do something. We're in the midst of a need, and we park our rumps. I'm, I'm guilty of this. We park our rumps. God, give me a sign. I'm going to tell on myself here. A, some time back, I, I have some issues with low blood sugars at night and typically when I'm sleeping. Um, but I, you know, tossing back and forth was uncomfortable and oh, man, my sugar's probably low. And so I said, okay, God, give me a sign. If my sugar's not low, you know, I'll just go to sleep. But if it is low, uh, you know, show me some way. And, uh, Help me, Father, to be mature in this. Now, I, I don't know how you guys hear God. Um, it's not with my ears. It's just something that pops in here. Okay? And God said to me, maturity would be getting up and going and check your sugar. <laughs> oh, man! <laughs> and so I got up and I went and checked my sugar. And, and yep, my sugar was low and I got that address. Um, Sometimes we ask for things that uh, we really don't need an answer to. Sometimes we ask for things that uh, God in his wisdom is not going to give us because he knows how we mess it up. You are royal priests. You are a chosen generation. You are a people that he has made for himself. When the enemy comes to you and he starts lying to you and tearing you down and mixing things up and, and getting everything off, go 
back to this passage and declare, this is what God says. And you have to stay there. You can't get back. Oh, oh, today's a good day of faith. Tomorrow, not so much. No. It's not a matter of what we see or we don't see. It's a matter of what we know to be true. Yeah. All right? Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. I thank you, Father, for this family that you've put together at Jesus Community Church. I thank you, Father, that you are knitting us one into another. That, Father, at the end of things, we would be a glorious beautiful and magnificent tapestry that displays your love for the world. Help us, Father, to trust in you because you are faithful. You are steadfast. And, Father, you love us with a love that is not diminished. You love us with an everlasting love. 